Tyson, when I first started working with him, was in physically he was in a condition where everybody could see it was horrendous, you know. And but that was probably ten percent of how bad he was mentally. And then it came to a time where I was available and able to move in with Tyson. And when I moved in with him, obviously, um, I text Tyson and I'm an hour away or something. And uh, I think I can't remember. I think he answered the door, but only. Not so long ago did he reveal to me that he'd never told Paris, his wife, that I was coming, you know, and I'd never met Paris. Um, and, I, you know, she was thinking, who's this stranger coming to live with us? Tyson was like, oh, by the way, new trainer's here and he's moving in. And, um, you know, we'd gone from a working relationship to a friendship and uh, a very good friendship. And when you live with somebody under somebody else's roof with their full family and you get to know somebody that well, you know, and at the time, you know, I remember one of the first questions I asked him when I moved in with him, I said to him, what's the most important thing to you in your life? And he said, my family. And he, you know, along the way, he'd sort of say to me, you know, he knows what he's put his family through, um, you know, with the, uh, with how things have gone. And, um, and it was a difficult time, obviously, for everybody. So, uh, Sometimes I used to look across at him and I used to think, I don't know if this job's possible. And I knew how much boxing meant to him and what he'd achieved meant to him. And it's something that he'd worked for all his life and, you know, his, his family are very proud of it. Everybody's very proud of it. So he didn't want to be a flash in a pan. He didn't want to come back, take a fight he shouldn't take, get a few quid and, you know, sail off into the sunset. It wasn't about that. It was so much more than that. It was so much more than just, just the comeback. You know, I actually saw the transition. And... It got to a point where I just thought to myself, even if he doesn't make a comeback, even if he does never box again, if I get this man back happy again, I'll, I'll be more than happy and I would have uh, achieved more than, more than what any single win or world championship would mean because literally, you know, Tyson said it himself, that it saved his life. Not just me, everybody that played a part as a full team, but his family, the team, you know, all together, that journey and that, that transition and that period saved his life. One day, you know, we was doing the same thing over and over in Spain, which, you know, routine and consistency. The first post I ever put on social media of me and Tyson working together was labelled that, routine and consistency, because I knew that was key to getting back mentally where he needed to be. And it's, it's the key to everything. If you want to achieve things, you've got to have routine and you've got to be consistent with it. One day we decided to change things up. I said, look, we're going to walk up Istan Mountain this time, which is a run that I've done with a lot of the boxers. Not Heavyweights don't really do the run. So, yeah, OK, no problem. So we pull up at the bottom of the, the, bottom of the mountain where the start is. Tyson gets out and he's loosening himself off, having a stretch out. And I'm thinking to myself, what is this idiot doing? We're only going for a walk, an hour's walk or whatever. And, um, boom, he starts jogging. I'm thinking, OK. Give him a couple of minutes here, stop in a second. A couple of minutes goes by, give him another five minutes, he'll be down, let him get in the car. Five minutes goes by and he'll stop in a minute, he'll stop in a minute. And the whole way I was thinking, event he's going to stop in a minute, he's going to quit. And he was running with some younger lads that was sort of pushing the tempo, pushing the pace. And probably about three quarters of the way I was thinking, he's going to stop in a second, he's got to. And all of a sudden he starts sprinting. And that moment there I thought to myself, this man's made of something else mentally, physically, you know, because a heavyweight man that size in shape sh should struggle doing that. A man in that condition certainly shouldn't be able to do that. And then to actually push on, I thought, so got to the top and I said, right, we're here, this is the top. He said, is this the top, this is where everyone stops? I said, yeah. He said, that, well then that's not where I stop. And he carried on going an extra mile and a half, two miles, right to the top and, and that was a standout moment for me. I would watch two, three, four Deontay Wilder fights every single day, over and over and over, to make sure that I hadn't missed anything, make sure that I understood this man, and it need, I needed to get to a point where I felt like I knew what he was going to do before he knew he was going to do it. I always, I don't usually do the ring walk with the, with the fighters. I'll start, start with them, walk off, make sure they're right, walk off, wait in the ring for them to do their thing, and, you know, the camera and all the rest of it. So I'll wait in the ring, and... Um, Tyson come through and we had a plan that we knew Wilder was going to take his time on the ring walk. So I took a set of pads so that Wilder took 
five, ten minutes to do it, we could still be warming up in the ring. So we carried on doing that and then I put the pad to one. Just as Wilder was stepping in the ring, he was pushing the rope down to step over the top rope. I noticed he likes to step over the top rope. So I lifted the rope up and I remember his foot half getting caught on the rope. And I thought anything, something just to disrupt him a little bit. And I remember him looking along at me and I just gave him a wink. Then obviously there's all the introductions and that and I could see Tyson was getting to him. Tyson was pumped. And the last words I said to him before the bell went when I had to get out of the ring was, God, don't make mistakes. He was, he was pumped up, you know, and, uh, and I knew, Tyson actually said to me, you know, he said, when I boxed Klitschko, he said, I, uh, I prepared myself for somebody that's very heavy handed. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest punches in heavyweight history, Klitschko. He said, so I, uh, I come out and I caught the jab and I thought, yeah, he's heavy handed, you know, be switched on. He said, and I've done the same for, for Wilder. He said, and I caught the first jab and I was like, what the fuck was that? He said, it was literally like a brick. But Tyson needs that, that bit of motivation, that bit of fear factor, that bit of, okay, you've got something special as well. Because Wilder's a special fighter as well. That brings the best out in Tyson. And that's something that was lacking in, in, in his last fight, you know. He needs that, and that's when you're going to get the best out of Tyson. And that fight, a lot of it was about positioning in the ring, where the fight was taking place was a huge part of it. Um, and how to get the fight to take part in those areas of the ring. Um, you know, sometimes you can hear trainers, I want to left hook, right hand, left hook, uppercut, hook, right hand, you know? You're living in dreamland, mate, you know? But by that point, my friendship with Tyson's chucked aside. He's not my friend, he's not. He's my fighter and I've got to do a job. Emotions got to go to one side because if I'm emotionally involved, he probably wouldn't have got through that fight against Wilder in the 12th round, I may have just, Oh, oh, chuck the towel in. You know, I wanted to keep Tyson calm. I didn't want to come back. Look, Tyson, we're three minutes away. We can do this. And build anxiety in him. Because anxiety in a fighter can cause mistakes. I said to him, faints will maintain the distance. When you change your height, like I said, tie him up. And if, you, if you've done that a couple of times in a round, lost 10 seconds here, lost 10 seconds there. You know, you can make a three minute round, a, a two minute round. So it was important for him to just nullify Wilder that round. I knew he was there not to take any silly chances. I told him, you need to see it out, make it boring, because I knew, those were my words to him, make it boring, because I knew this man was dangerous. And I knew Deontay Wilder is a special fighter. If Wilder got three minutes in him, you got to just start throwing punches and not stop. You know, there was elements before the fight talking about the judges. And Tyson was worried about judges and he was, you know, it was something that come up, come up in conversation a few times. And I do believe that Tyson thought, you know, I need to finish this, this strong to make sure I've got it in the bag. And like I say, a split second lapse in concentration, you know, uh, taken away from the game plan. In life, we can, only, we can only focus on what we can control. If it's out of our control, don't worry about it. You know, and he let something that's out of his control affect what he was doing in the ring. And he just, I think he got a little bit too offensively minded. He landed a one-two, and I know he was thinking, I'm going to get you again in a second, because throughout the fight, he'd landed a one-two, gained a little bit of distance, landed again, almost in two phases. And I knew that he was thinking, OK, I'm going to nail you again. And that split second in concentration, that little bit of greediness, he almost paid the final price for. Oh, and down he goes! Right hand, left hand! I'm screaming <laughs> about 30 times. I genuinely did think that was it. And I put my head in my hands and I prayed up to God. And I remember looking, thinking, but when a fighter's hurt, but they're going to get up, something's moving. Their hands are moving, their feet are moving, they're rolling over, their heads popped up. He was still. Feet was not moving, hands was not moving. So I didn't even think about chucking the towel in. I thought, that is it. I thought, it's over. Nothing, he's not moving. And before I know it, by the time I look back round, after an argument with the commission, um, trying to have a look while he's getting up, I'm thinking... He looks okay. The ref asked him to take a step to the side, which is something that Jack Reese has always done, if you look back on. 
He's done that for a number of years, asking a fighter, step to the side, step to the side, are you okay, then carry on. His legs were fine, his legs were underneath him. And uh, like I say, I knew that Wilder was a formidable finisher. And um, so now was, uh, now was panic time. A massive part of boxing is being able to break that man in front of him's will. And when Wilder saw Tyson get up, I think he done a, uh, took a huge part of Wilder away from him. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. But like I say, friendship goes aside when he gets in the ring. I'm doing my job. And my job right in this moment is assessing, is he okay to carry on? Um, and, it, you know, he went into a full guard posture. Wilder landed a massive left hook and I'm thinking, okay, you know, I know Jack Reese is an experienced referee and I'm thinking, do, do I need to do something here? And then just at the right time, Tyson manages to, to tie him up and grip him up. I remember turning around to Freddie saying, how long do you think? When really, you know, when you, you've been in boxing for a long time, you, you've almost got a three minute timer in your head in built. So I knew there's probably, what, 20 seconds left. Um, but I was looking for a bit of encouragement, you know? How long do you think? Like, <laughs> tell me 10 seconds. <laughs> Um, it was one of them, you know, and I, I knew that by this point, you know, Tyson had... The knockdown happened, and all I wanted from Tyson at that point was just nullify him. You've lost the round. You're not going to win this round back. Just nullify him, see the round through. But he had that, that, that um, onslaught where Tyson started pushing Wilder back and dominated. The last 10, 15, 20 seconds, I'm thinking, just nullify him. Just nullify him. No silly risks. We did it, you know, we won that fight. You know, 90% of boxing believed that we won that fight. Yeah, and I remember, you know, I thought, I wonder how wide it was. And I asked BT Sport, what have you got? And they said to me, 9-3, whatever it was. I looked at Paulie Malinagi, I said, what have you got? And he said, 9-3, 8-4. I thought, okay, I looked at Floyd Mayweather. And I said, what have you got? And he laughed, <laughs> easy. Your man, easy as if to say, what are you even asking for? Easy, cleared it. And I thought, right. And I got uh, the news before it got read out that we had a draw. Even a draw, the decision is a split decision a draw. At that moment, I was raging. I was thinking for that man to have gone through what that man's gone through from the very, very start to there, to not only what he went through in that 36 minutes, when a man hits like he could knock this building over, to keep going through that, to go through that training camp that he put himself through, to go through that process of that alone, then put the mental health on top of it, then put the weight loss on top of it, then put the demons and the, you know, all the rest of it that he's had to go through and put himself through physically, mentally, emotionally, to then have that happen, I was very, very, very upset. And the more success that Tyson has, the more success we all have because the story goes on. That single-handed three minutes has inspired thousands, millions of people around the world that when they've been down and out, that you can come back. To people that outside of boxing forget boxing, what it means to boxing, what it means to people that have struggled with the similar sort of things that he struggled with. It means, it means their life to a lot of them. I've been to dinner shows with him, my parents have come over, broke down in tears. A grown man broke down in tears in front of him, saying, you've saved my life, you've saved my child's life. When you see that, it's surreal. And maybe then, you know, it started to sink in with him, actually, you know, this is, uh, this is what it means.